Welcome, everybody, to a very special edition, a uh, Academy of Insurance author conversation. Uh, I'll be your host today, Patrick Rate, Director of Education for the Academy of Insurance. And with me today is author Chris Klein, author of the new book, The Inertia of Legacy. Chris is a self-professed science geek trained on insurance and graphic design, which, by the way, parenthetically, that's one of those mixes of life that you you don't see coming right uh chris is a speaker and author uh, who's looking to help us fight against our own inertia to build the legacy that we desire chris welcome it's good to see you today no oh, thank you very much for having me patrick appreciate you and everybody on the team for the support and believing investing and sort of helping not sort of fully helping bring this maybe wacky idea to life but um Boy, as we've worked on this thing over the last, I mean, six months now, I'm guessing it feels as though maybe longer. Uh, the idea is resonating with people. And I'm just, I can't say it with enough sincerity, beyond humbled and honored that uh, we're working together to bring this and share it with some folks. Yeah, and this has been a fun process. Uh, now, a mutual friend brought us together, another author that we work with, and uh, and it was uh, to me that's that's the sign that that maybe we're doing some things right on our end that that we could uh, an author would recommend another author. So we're just we're just grateful to be able to work with folks like you to to bring uh, these ideas to market and. Um, you know, a lot of the books that we've done in the past uh, and and I uh, have uh, have published are very kind of technical insurancey books. This is not a technical insurancey book. Um, so, where did you get the idea to apply the, this idea of inertia to the idea of legacy? Now that's yeah, it's a great point too, and a good clarity, I suppose, for the folks who are watching. You know, kind of an insurance business publisher bringing somebody who's grown up in the insurance industry together. I mean, there's an insurance vibe to the whole thing, but this is, this is far from an insurance specific book. This is a life book. This is a business book. Um, but the long story is super condensed, I guess. And anybody that knows me know that I don't do anything super condensed. Um, brevity has been on my professional development plan as long as, long as I've been employed, but I've, I've long been a science geek and I wanted to be a mechanical engineer and, um, kind of joke about this in the book, but I just ran out of intellectual horsepower in the middle of calculus too. So I changed majors and became a fine art major, but always fascinated by the arts and, and sciences and, and sort of fringy type things that a lot of people don't focus on. And, and, um, but also had a very successful and still have a very successful insurance career. And I've been very fortunate to have a ton of experiences and I don't know. It goes back a number of years at four to six, somewhere in that range, I guess. I started to put together notes as I re-immersed myself into science. And I had this epiphany that a lot of these scientific principles, math, physics, science, maybe astronomy, not astrology, although I suppose that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, when you explore them, there are principles in them that could be translated to our personal or professional lives. And so I have a notebook um, of eight or nine principles like that are relatively well-known again, math, science, physics type stuff that I think could translate in a quasi esoteric way into life. But in the middle of doing that, one of them was Newton's laws of motion and, and specifically inertia. And I started to think about that and how big our industry is and those types of things. But also in our industry, I noted that in pockets, we seem to have procured the word legacy and applied somewhat of a negative connotation to it. And maybe I was guilty. You know, I would think legacy carrier, legacy agent, legacy employee. We see it in software, legacy software. And right. that kind of has a aged, highly tenured, maybe not as relevant maybe resistant to change, maybe a little clunky. You know, you think about all those kind of things. And it bothered me a little bit because everywhere else in the world, the word legacy by and large has a positive connotation. Um, right. 
And so I thought, do something about it. Well, in my pr professional life, I just, I tried. I was not fully successful. I tried to stop using legacy to reference, you know, high tenure, you know, longstanding incumbent type scenarios. But then I thought, do something about it. You can change, which reading or doing some sort of a podcast and inertia came up. And I'm like, well, that's just simply it. You can be your own inertia. And it clicked. There's a whole thing to this. And so anyway, I started to frame all this stuff together. And I got to the point where I knew I had enough to explore it, but I didn't have enough in my mind to create sort of an objective view of this. And so sat down at a computer last November and said to heck with it. I'm going to start writing and see what happens. And we can chat about how we got to some of the more mechanical and objective parts of, of the book, if you'd like, but um, some things came to you. So kind of, kind of a lesson in that, like lean into it. And sometimes what you're looking for or didn't know what you were looking for will come to you, you know, on the journey. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you made some, make some excellent points uh, related to um, it, you. We'll talk a little bit about your, your matrix uh, of legacy sure. uh, where, where we, um, we see people in a, on a spectrum of really intentional to not very intentional at all. And uh, that in itself can provide or fight against some inertia and uh and that it, I to me it started with the idea of how closely are we paying attention to what our legacy will be out in the future is that kind of uh is that kind of some of the the what you were looking to get across yeah and you know I was trying to think of a way to visualize it because in my mind the concept was relatively clear I mean we explore this in the book, there's maybe nothing more personal to an individual or their business. If they've, you know, if they're an entrepreneur or, or have taken over, acquired a business in some way, um, then that of the legacy, which you're building and leaving behind, whether you use that word or not, um, that seems to be one of the most personal things we can do and, and take care of. And yet, relatively few people, at least in those, in that vocabulary, seem to be as intentional as they could about manage, defining and managing the legacy. And so part of it was about undoing the word and sort of reclaiming it with a positive view, um, recognizing, I guess, if it doesn't have a positive application, then that's, there's a set of circumstances that exist there. Right. And, um, so this inertia thing, then as it started to couple together and I started to explore the concept, I started to think about how do you visualize, you know, I mean, a several hundred year old Newtonian law and something is really kind of squishy and nebulous as legacy, you know, legacy in its own ways, kind of like the wind, right. like, you know, it when you see it, um, so how do you define it, which is hard. So at any rate, uh, I was... I don't even know where this stuff comes to you. And this is why I say, sometimes you got to immerse yourself into something like that. Don't wait until you have it all because you'll never have it all. And even if you think you have it all, it'll evolve. So I just fully immersed myself in the concept. And I started to think about, I'm really talking about a simple, like a, like a two, like a two variable view. You've got this, this legacy thing and you've got an inertia thing. And we all at some point in our schooling, got shown what an X, Y axis looks like and how it's a phenomenal visual for comparing two seemingly disparate uh, variables. Right. And so I played around with that a little bit. So what happens if I took the overall health of one's legacy on one axis and the amount of effort or energy one goes into defining and managing their legacy on the other? And I could show you the sketchbook here. I think I've sent you a picture of it. Um, the first time I sketched that out and it, it crystallized for me that, wow, these quadrants really resonate. And I could start to think about people, businesses that I've worked with inside and outside of our industry. I could think about my own life and where I may or not fit at different points in my life. And so, you know, in a nutshell, if you take that thing, you got this really high, high caliber legacy that's clear and defined and, and, and those in your sphere know about it. And there's intent behind it. You end up in that quadrant. On the other end of that quadrant, 
by design is there's a poor or undefined legacy and little to no effort in doing anything about it. And then you end up with these really unique quadrants on the other side where one might have or have had a quality legacy, either again as an individual or a business, but the amount of effort or energy they're putting into it starts to wane. Mm -hmm. And that's a very unique dynamic. And then on the other side of it, what if you sort of have an epiphany in life or you've acquired a business or you move into a new role or change careers and you have a lot of intention, you're willing to put in the heavy work, but your, your legacy is undefined. And so each one of those quadrants creates quite a different set of circumstances um, and a seemingly easy, at least as I was going through that, ability to kind of articulate what it's like to live or exist in that quadrant. And then, so maybe I'll stop there and see if there's any follow-up before I kind of dive into how we frame that in the book. Yeah. So, and, and in coming up with those, those quadrants, um, I think you, I think you did a great job of personalizing that, making it, making it feel very much like this is, this is not just a theoretical thing. This is very relatable. And as we, as we're talking about this today, uh, you know, if you, if you look at the news on today, you may, you'll see some companies with whatever their legacy is, uh, and, uh, a, a, some, a, uh, um, entrepreneur, a businessman or a businesswoman who is stepping down from a, a large role and, and handing off this thing that they built to the next generation of, of what somebody will do. And, and really this is, this is felt like a very personal thing in not just the, not just the speaking about your own journey, but the, the journeys of people that you communicate and businesses that you communicate. And uh, it, um, it, it, not only does it feel very easy to understand, I think it is very easy to understand and it connects with people because we, without having to be scientists, we all understand the idea of inertia that, that uh, un unless we continue to add effort to the car, the, uh, the, uh, the road will continue to slow it down, slow us down. The the lack of energy added to the engine will continue to slow us down. And, and we, we understand it on a, on a very, I think a very simple level in our lives. And it, and it just makes sense. Right. Um, and you had, uh, you, you got to use a gyroscope as a, uh, as part of your logo there. And, and <laughs> and you talk about the gyroscope in in throughout here. In fact, there's uh, the last the last chapter. One of the one of the fun things about it is we have uh, 0.5 chapters. We have the uh, the 0 0.5 and the 10.5. And you talk about uh, life lessons from the gyroscope. And uh, you know, um, I think that really does communicate much of what you're what you're trying to to talk about here what what is it about the gyroscope that just grabs you well i mean yeah here's one right here um and maybe it really just exposes the amount of geekdom that i have because i've i've got one on my desk here and it's you know it's kind of fun to play with and and but you know i guess in a more in a more serious way i mean i it didn't really hit to me so i started to write the book i was not thinking about a gyroscope as the visual representation of the message um, or even anything to explore. But um, again, it was just one of those things where I was just fumbling around with it. I thought this is for something so simple. It, you think about the most, some of the most sophisticated devices ever existed. Mm -hmm. You know, they rely on a functioning gyroscope. Yep. Every, every navigation system, almost every navigation system from, yep. The airline I was on last night, uh, despite the weather, um, to the International Space Station, to you know the James Webb Deep Space you know Telescope, all of these things have that. Ships, the whole nine yards, um, and so it got me thinking about that a little bit. And here's something: in I had I've had these as a kid, and so I, I might have mentioned. I know I mentioned in the book. My dad was a mechanical engineer and always brought me cool tool stuff, you know, stuff to play with, and probably why I wanted to be a mechanical engineer, but. As a kid, I had gyroscopes and there was these kind of things that you can buy and you can wind a string around them and do stuff with them. And then I had other ones that had like little wire handles, you could move them around. And I was always fascinated. And this is the lesson, you know, so this is a, a device 
by and large, with very clear intent. It's a stability device, and it can have calculated stability based on how fast it spins and how heavy it is. And then these sophisticated devices have sensors that can kind of react to what this thing is doing as it is affected by external forces. Right. And then, of course, correcting the whole nine yards. And so when this thing is acting within its intended design, which is spinning, it is remarkably stable. Mm -hmm. When it's not spinning, it will fall off the floor. I, it's really kind of awkward to hold. It's not really a sphere. It's got these things. So here's this device that when it's, it's intended for some of the coolest stuff in the world, which I think every human being and every business is, right? We've all got great intention if we think about it, define our legacy, that whole thing. Um, but when it's not in motion, when it's not acting within its intended purpose, it's, I mean, this is extreme to say, it's its essentially useless for more than a paperweight. Um, right. In fact, it'll fall off the floor. And these are heavy. If you've ever played with one, fall on your foot or something like that, it hurts. But when you get really focused on it, you really get it spinning and it's motion. Not only is it remarkably stable, it can actually combat external forces, right? And so if I had this thing, well, first of all, it wouldn't even stand up on my finger. But right. if it was spinning, it would stand on my finger. And if I tried to push it, I could feel it. And that's the inertia of the flywheel spinning. And so I started to think about this as a metaphor for life. And so we all have to understand what our purpose is or to create our own purpose. And Simon Sinek talks about in his famous book, Start With Why. Mm -hmm. Understand what your purpose is. Be intentional about that. And then understand what it takes for you to bring that intention to life. And in this case, it's speed and stability and the whole nine yards. We all have something different. And once you're doing the effort and the energy and you're moving in a way that aligns with your intent, the amount of stability that you have and your ability to bring that to life and execute against that is phenomenal. And if you're doing it really well and really stay focused on it and make sure the speed is, is, is consistent and aligned with your goal, you can start to combat external forces. And that's what we explore in the book is that, you know, the inertia says an object at rest stays at rest or stays in motion unless acted upon by an external force. We explore internal and external forces mm -hmm. as well. And so even in the best quadrant, which we call uniform motion, you're there, things are stable and you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. There's a set of forces that you have to stay focused on. Mm -hmm. Um because an external force can be lack of effort, lack of clarity, distraction, and it can also be market conditions or weather patterns or things that you're out of your control. So anyway, long way around on that thing to say it was just one of those observations that let's explore something that looks very simple, but and is moderately useless unless it's really working the way it's intended, which mm -hmm. pretty much everything is, um, yeah. and apply it to this principle. Yeah. So, and it, it, it speaks to really um, it, it, as you as you talk, think about that gyroscope. But you mentioned that uh, as it's spinning at its uh, intended rate of rate of spin, it, its stability increases and makes it less vulnerable to outside forces. Now we all know that there are some things, as you mentioned, out of our control that could really change you know, the stability of a life or a business. But it seems as though with intention and work, that stability can be recovered and it can, you know, it can, it, we can, we can move past these things. And, and uh, that, that's one of the things that, that really speaks to, to me about the, the way that you put this whole thing together with this. Um, Listen, in, in you mentioned that you know, your father was a mechanical engineer, and this feels like a very personal work for you. Um, is there anything, anything else that you'd like? I don't know. Make sure that we communicate about about your book uh, in this forum right now. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, my father was an engineer. My mom was a teacher. So, I mean, I was just you know, I was hardwired um, to be a lifelong learner and explore things and always encouraged uh, and supported in trying new different and new and different things. And so I think we talk about this briefly in the book, but um, that 
that started early for me. And I think we all, if you start to take this concept and go back, and even though none of us knew it at certain times in our life, we were applying inertia, you know, to our legacy. So I talk about a couple of those personal life experiences, you know, in, in, and all of that, but, um, and how these decisions do alter sort of the trajectory we're on and ultimately, you know, what our, your ultimate legacy is. And so very fortunate in some regards that those decisions seemingly on the fly as a high school kid or a college kid or earlier in your career or whatever, you know, ended up working out well. And I'd like to think that was just because of a great upbringing and um, being encouraged to try new things and supported in those things. Um, but that doesn't always go as planned. And we all have things that we look back on and say, gosh, I wonder what if. And so it is deeply personal in that regard. And so I it just challenge is probably the wrong word. Encourage people to kind of think about these decisions through this lens of the inertia, a legacy, because what you do or don't do does have an impact on the trajectory and the path that you're on. And there's this an old, old saying that says, if you don't know where you're going, any path will get you there. If you have a definition about what you think you want your legacy to be, what you'd ultimately like to become and what you would want to be remembered as again, as an individual or as a business, then the decisioning easier is a, is a funky word to me, but at least there's a set of criteria to evaluate your decision-making process through. And, um, you know, it'd been fascinating to have these concepts as a younger person. Do you, you know, I quit playing high school basketball after my sophomore year. What if I had tried to stay that? Well, I wouldn't have gone on to do this thing and I might not have done that or I would have been in different friends when I graduated. And why wow, you start to trace that stuff back? And that's a part of a legacy because every one of those things got you there. And so deeply personal in that regard. And, you know, that's what I think is um, that means the most to me about this is I do believe there's something in this book, multiple things in this book that people can learn from uh, and apply and maybe think about with their own lives and, and the legacy they want to build and leave. Um, but ultimately this was, this was a brainstorm of my own. I don't know. Uh, I didn't know how it was going to work to connect Newton, to connect Newton's laws with physics or uh, with physics, with, with legacy and could it be connected and um, getting it done and, and in, in a position to share it with, with others who, who may find value is, is deeply meaningful. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks for, for taking some time today uh, and talking about your book, The Inertia of Legacy. Of, don't want to cover up your name there. <laughs> <laughs> Available for pre-order now in Kindle and uh, Apple Books. Uh, Available hardcover, paperback, and audiobook October 10. Uh, we'll put we'll make sure to put links in the description of this video and uh chris uh, thanks again we appreciate you taking time to be with us today thank you and appreciate everybody who's who's watching this video and um who takes a flyer and buys the book and um you know maybe does some deep in, uh, reflection and introspection i mean it, it it means a great deal to me to share this with everybody thank you so folks, let us know if you get the book and let us know how much you enjoy it. Uh, share it with, with others. So on behalf of Chris Klein, uh, I'm Patrick Wright with the Academy of Insurance. Uh, you'll be the same person you are today a year from now, except for the people you meet and the books you read. Take care, everybody. Have a great day.